Hello and welcome. This is Lisa Jones, and you are listening to the Exploring Death Podcast. Hello, it's Lisa Jones with the Exploring Death Podcast, and today I have with me Sherry Amay. She's a near-death survivor, heart transplant recipient, and global speaker. She travels the world sharing her remarkable story of recovery and resilience. Sherry is co-author of God's Fingerprints, Impressions of Near-Death Experiences, and the book, 20 Beautiful Women, 20 More Stories That Will Heal Your Soul, Ignite Your Passion, and Inspire Your Divine Purpose. She's been featured in several major media outlets, including The Dr. Oz Show, NBC Today, NBC News, Megyn Kelly Today, ABC News, Fox, Forbes, and Inc. Magazine. Sherry is listed as the top 18 women you need to know now and recently named female leader of the year. Her one simple mission is to impact 1 billion lives. Welcome, Sherry. Thank you so much. It's so great to see you. (laughs) It's so great to see you. Sherry and I met back in 2012. We were just catching up before we started the podcast and holy cow, we have both come so far. (laughs) From 2012. And um, I was actually speaking at the Ridgefield Playhouse. It was my first time on stage. And you were in the audience listening to my experience of my shared death experience and then, you know, channeling passed away loved ones. And you reached out to me and said, oh, can we go to lunch? And we went to lunch and you told me an extraordinary story, which I think you were, you hadn't really shared with many people at that point. But um, is that, is that what you remember? Yeah, no, I, I really hadn't at that time. I mean, it was so early. I think we were saying it was around 2012 and I had had my near-death experience in 2010. And it was one of those things where it was so personal, you know, and I also was still making sense. I mean, it really didn't start to fully make sense for about seven years. Wow. Wow. I've got chills as you're saying that, because I think it's so true that when it happens, um, there's so much happening. And even for me, it's been 15 years since my shared death experience and only recently, and actually you and I were just chatting too, that we've suddenly come into this new community of near death experiencers. And it's like, oh my gosh, we didn't even know that there was all of these other people that had had something similar happen to them. And it's, it's actually a really large group of people. It is, and it's so incredible. I I first was introduced to this group last year while speaking at a conference in Austin, Texas, and you and I now know some of the very same people. They're top authors, um, incredible speakers with amazing near-death stories, and I remember that that conference that I went to, I actually didn't even know what to feel because I had never sat down and actually been in a room full of other people that had gone through what I had. So there was this adjustment period. I actually didn't even know how I felt about it because I was so used to just knowing my story. And then when you see how so many of our stories, um, while, you know, some of the details may be different, the overall themes are so similar. Um, And I think when you've been holding it inside yourself for so many years, thinking, you know, nobody really is ever going to understand what you went through. And then to meet, you know, so many people that share this, this similar um, experience that not many people can relate to. It was incredible. Wow. That is, that is fascinating. And another thing I remember so clearly is that you reached out to me because your husband you you took him to my my show. I remember you said you kind of dragged him along. You said, come on, we're going to go see this millionaire medium or whatever I was back then. I forget. Corporate consciousness, I think, is what I was going by. <clears throat> and um, but, but I think there was something happened that helped him make a believer out of... Yes. Do you remember that? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I do remember um, having him come to your event and I don't know how I put it, but I wasn't quite wanting to share with him exactly what you did. And it was so funny seeing the look on his face halfway <laughs> through. But what was so amazing was we got home later that night and you had been talking about angels and, and um, communicating with the other side. And he out of the blue said to me, 
do you think all we- angels he said something to me like something to the fact like do do all angels have do they look like they have wings you know i think we see the drawings and the pictures of angels and that wasn't something that he had seen so he was asking me like he he, did, he had witnessed something when i was on life support fighting for my life and he said you know can angels just look like even a a moving like shimmer in a corner of a room. And he started describing it and he started describing the hue and the coloring. And it was the same coloring that I had seen in the afterlife. And so he was telling me about this almost ball of energy that was very fluid and it had this bright hue uh color blue that he couldn't quite describe he said it was it was unlike any other color blue he had ever seen and it was just kind of floating throughout the room just very elegantly and he said that when i was on um, life support and in my coma he said the doctors would come in and it would just gently hover to the other side of the room and move out of the doctor's way. And then when they would leave the room, it would just gently hover right back over and just kind of hover above me, you know, sometimes in the top uh, of the room, the ceiling, maybe in the corner of the room. But it was, it was very, he was not, he was never afraid of it, you know. And at the time, he says, he wasn't even thinking clearly he thought well maybe he was just tired or something but um because it was so non-threatening he just didn't think much of it and this kept happening when the doctors would come in it would just gently move away now there was a family member that had um you know i had had issues with my whole life and this family member whenever they would come into the room while I was in the coma, this graceful, angelic uh, form that was hovering in the room would not act the way it would when the doctors would come in. As soon as this family member would come in, it would actually look like a vacuum hose had come in and sucked it right out of the room. And when he told me that, and he said it happened every time this person came into the room, and I was just, I was floored. I was floored, and I didn't know who to talk to about it. And so that's when I had reached out to you, and I was like, I have to tell somebody this. But even to this day, um, you know, it's still hard for him to understand what had actually happened to me. And it's still hard for him to see that I've gotten media attention and I tell my story. Um, And sometimes I forget, I forget that this was extremely traumatizing for him as well. Um, But I'll never forget that he asked me that because while he doesn't talk about it, he knows something happened when I was in that coma. He knows. And, that was when I had met you, it was such a pivotal time because um, my husband and I are still recovering from what happened. You know, I think people don't realize how traumatic, um, you know, it, it the, these health challenges can be. I mean, let alone this wild near death story, but then the health challenge associated with it. So, yeah, you were right there, like during a really critical time. Um, where I was confused, still making sense of it. I would, it was only two years in. So I really like you were a big help. (laughs) Oh, well, I'm so glad I was there at the right time. I mean, and again, that was all divine (laughs) interaction, I'm sure. Well, let's, um, let's take our listeners back to what happened with your health crisis and and what brought you to your near-death experience. Yeah. So in April of 2010, um, I actually, um, experienced several weeks of just having difficulty breathing and uh, I went into the emergency room they didn't find anything wrong with me um, and sent me home and uh, as those months uh, as those weeks started um, kind of going by I I knew something was wrong with me I, I couldn't pinpoint 
where exactly it was in my body, but I knew I felt off. And I, I couldn't, I, I think I looked okay. So it was really just kind of brushed off. And as the time went on, I started realizing, I think I'm dying. And how do you tell somebody that when you look fine? You know, they're gonna think you're crazy. And plus you had already just gone to the emergency room. So it was a very um, wild time. Um, but what ended up happening was I wasn't feeling well because I was in heart failure. It came on very quick. And um, I remember the last moment uh, right before I flatlined, uh, I wasn't feeling well. So thankfully that morning, my husband did end up rushing me to the hospital because I complained that both of my arms felt heavy. Um, and about 10 minutes after walking into the emergency room, I flatlined literally right in his arms. Um, and that's when they began, um, you know, the whole staff began uh, a CPR on me, um, ready to call my time of death within five, 10 minutes. They could not get my heart to restart. Um, and one man in that emergency room refused to give up and they continued CPR for over 90 minutes on me. And by a miracle, my heart never did restart, but the 90 minutes gave them enough time to install a temporary life support device, hook me up to their machines so that um, machines were actually feeding my organs with oxygen. So they didn't know if I was brain dead or not, um, but I ended up being transferred to New York Presbyterian Hospital in New York City, which was, I don't know, like 50, 60 miles from my house, um, a hospital we hadn't been familiar with up till that point. And that's where I underwent uh, life-changing open heart surgery. I was in a coma for three, four months. So I have a, a pretty big medical file. Um, and it was very, it was a very traumatic period. Um, but during the time when I had flatlined, I actually remember um, my last words to my husband was, pick me up, pick me up, because I had been laying flat. And I said, pick me up, pick me up, because I couldn't breathe. And he came over and he lifted me up. And that was it. Those are my life. So it was literally seconds. And then I don't remember anything else but that day, but that second right before I died. And um, I remember instantly crossing over and just being this formless, white, um, just light as a feather. Um, I still remember feeling like Sherry, but I knew I was no longer alive. Um, and it's just so incredible because my first thought when I crossed over was, wow. Like I had been worried about what that moment had, would feel like my whole life. And it was like, I can't believe it. Like I crossed over. Um, and I just remember feeling, it was weird. My initial reaction was like relief. I think because I didn't realize how much of a burden I had felt on people my whole life. Um, I always felt like the outcast, you know? I always felt like the one who was always like too creative, laughing too much, having too much fun, or wanting to play too much, or like, I just, I never fit in, you know? It was like, I wasn't just like somebody that just got good grades. Like I got good grades, but then I was really fun. Then I love sports. And you know, when you're growing up, it's you're segmented into so many groups, you know? There's like the smart kids, the athletes, the this and that. And I was always friends with everyone. Um, so, you know, that's just one example, but even at home, I always felt like the oddball. I never like, you know, I, I just always had, I, I was always like, so too curious, you know, I was always just too everything. And so I don't know. It's like when I cr first crossed over, I just felt relieved. 
Isn't that mm-hmm. weird? Like I just felt relieved. Right. Um, yeah. Well, you were, you felt like, well, I don't know, but maybe it's that you like didn't have to fit in anymore. You just were. Yeah. You know, it's like, if I were to describe the sensation, it was like, it was like all of the burdens, all the stress and worry about living up to somebody else's expectations were like instantly removed. It was like a heavy jacket had just been taken off of me. And it was like, oh, you're just, you're just free to be love and light. And I think that initial feeling was, yeah, I mean, the only thing I could tell you what at that moment, you know, that initial moment when I crossed over, I just felt relief. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I, I think that was the moment I realized just how much in our waking, living, everyday lives, we are so disconnected from the truth of who we are. I mean, I got it. I got it. I felt it. You know, I physiologically, I felt it. Um, you know, and it's funny because a lot of people are like, you know, just having it, does heaven exist? Well, I'm like, that was heaven. No longer having to, you know, perform for someone, no longer having to separate myself from the truth of like the love that's naturally coming from me, but, but walking through the world and, and having people, you know, maybe it's a look, you know, look at me, like, why are you smiling too, too much? You know, why are you laughing too much? You know, we're supposed to be working, you know, there's no fun allowed. Right. right. Uh, yeah. All that judgment that, that yeah, is just in, it's like an epidemic or something that everybody's just judging everybody all the time rather than just loving everyone all the time. Yes, absolutely. Judgment. That's exactly what it was. And I think it was the realization as well that, that while it's so easy to say that the world does it to us, I think it was that realization that I had done it to myself you know, like it was actually in my control. Um, and that, that is, that was that initial powerful awakening that I had as soon as I crossed over. Um, and from there, you know, I immediately remember meeting um, what I call my, my welcome guides. Um, and it was these beings that ended up surrounding me. Um, and you know, the scenery had changed. Um, I was no longer in the white light, but I was in another, um, scene almost as if it was a movie and these beings were just surrounding me in a circle. So I was in the middle and they had just surrounded me, but they weren't saying much. And I remember just knowing that I had died being okay with it feeling so much love and gratitude and so much assurance that not only was I okay, but that all of my loved ones that were still alive were completely okay. I had nothing to worry about. And with all of those things and remembering the heavy weight of that judgment and feeling like I was just always just this burden. I I was, who I was, was always making somebody uncomfortable. (laughs) Like, and I laugh now because I now know how ridiculous it is, but I know it's so serious for so many of us. This is how we live our lives. We, li- we don't even realize it because it's what we know. Right. It's so ingrained in us. Yes, it's so ingrained in us. So it's not until you actually finally release it. And in my case, it was actually released for me, you know, 
um, I just, I didn't realize how, how much I had given my power away. Um, so when I was surrounded by these beings, I said to them, I know where I am. I'm really happy here. Um, and I'm okay with not going back because I get it. This is what heaven feels like. Um, I don't need the judgment. I'm good. Um, and I remember getting so frustrated because no one was answering me. No one was saying, okay, guy, come with us like this way, you know? And, um, all of a sudden I realized that they were talking to me without words, without saying anything. So everything was telepathic. So I realized, oh, I think I just need to get quiet, get still so I could hear them. And sure enough, I heard that um, they understood what I was saying, but that they wanted to give me time to make that decision. And at that point, I remember just the whole scenery just swirling around me and it's as if time and space, because up till now, everything felt pretty still. Like everything was peaceful, it was still, it was calm. I felt safe, I felt loved. I was never afraid of these beings at all, ever. Um, I knew they were there like protecting me, keeping me safe. I knew the energy I was in was just filled with so much love. Um, but all of a sudden time and space that I had, as I had known it had collapsed and they had taken me on it. You know, it's funny. I almost describe it as like, um, what's that Christmas movie? Like the night before Christmas or something. When oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, that was my life review. It was like going, they took me on this like little journey through my lifetime reviews, but it wasn't just uh, a lifetime review of like this current life that I had left. It was like all of my soul's lifetimes, which was so wild because they were lifetimes in the past, uh, present, future, and parallel lives. So some of these lifetimes that I was experiencing were happening at the same time meaning I was actually living to, I was reviewing and living um, two lives at once. And when I say a life review, I mean, I was taken through them, not as an observer, but actually living those, I relived those lifetimes, just as real as you and I talking here. So this was huge, you know, um, and I remember this whole journey. I remember many of the different lifetimes, um, some more pleasant than others. Um, but I remember, I remember realizing that there was this common theme amongst all of the lifetime uh, experiences. And I remember being like, this feels so familiar. This is that same gut feeling. Like whatever the lifetime was, it always had this pivotal moment where it emotionally affected me in the same body part. And I was like, what is this? This is so weird. And as the reviews went on and on, which literally felt like years. I mean, when I was in my coma, I when I fell into the coma, the initial coma, it was seven days long. Seven days in earth years. <laughs> in the afterlife felt like years. Wow. Years. It felt like it went on and on and on. And one of the one of the life reviews was actually reviewing my own um, funeral. So when I say like some lifetimes were okay and some were a little bit more traumatic, like that was one of the ones that felt like it went on forever, but it was so, it was heartbreaking to witness people that I loved literally mourning and wailing over me. I mean, I witnessed it all. 
And um, that was also one of the ones that kept repeating over and over again, almost like Groundhog Day, if you've ever seen that movie. Right. And so that, right, so one of the most traumatic lifetime reviews, once it finished, it would, it would repeat. I would go through the whole funeral again. And it did it like multiple times. So this whole ordeal was going on for, um, you know, like I said, what felt like years. And so um, eventually I ended up saying, I get it now. I get what the theme was between all of my um, experiences. I was able to match up what that feeling, that pit in my stomach that kept following me from lifetime to lifetime and how it matched up with the lifetime I had just left. So when I realized that, I realized that there was this common thread between all of them and that everything that I had experienced in this current life that I just left wasn't actually an accident. These were all things that I was meant to go through and will continue to go through until I figure out how to clear them. And that death did not mean the end of clearing those. So a lot of times people say, well, what's, what's it gonna matter after I die? Well, I experienced that it does matter. You know, how you behave, how you act in this lifetime does matter. Um, and I realized it was my, uh, my responsibility to, um, and my responsibility only to keep my soul clear. Um, and as issues come up, it's about continuously clearing that so that they don't keep repeating. And that was the experience and the lesson I learned in the afterlife. And so after going through everything, I said to my guides, okay, I get it. Like I choose to actually go back. So originally I said to them, I wanted to stay in the afterlife this time because I realized these same issues are going to keep going, but they may play out in a, a different scenario with new people. And it may be worse than before. So I was like, Oh, I'm not going through this again in a worse format, you know, um, with a whole new set of people starting from scratch. So I said, I'm going to go back. I know what it was that I had done, what I had allowed myself to either do or not do. And I'm going to go back and I'm going to fix it. So I had made the decision to you know, I was ready to come back, but I didn't have a body to come back to yet because I had just, my body had just crashed. So there was a whole waiting period. Um, I call it like almost my rebirth um, period was very traumatic. Um, it, not the whole thing, but I would say towards the end, but I did have to go uh, through this whole period where I went into like, um, they took me up to this mansion, this glistening mansion out in the middle of nowhere on the top of a mountain, this whole, um, like a compound. And I remember just being inside this massive mansion. Everything was white, just pure white. And I remember them keeping me in a room and I said to myself, why am I in here? And I, they just laid me on a bed. I was dressed in all white. The bed was all white. And they would leave me in there, close the door, and they would come back in every once in a while and check on me. And once again, everything was telepathic. And I realized that my body had to recover in the, in the other realm that I had just left. And so even though I had made the decision, I now needed to wait for my soul to be able to reemerge back into my body, my physical body. So the waiting, I remember being so long and so frustrating because I was like, <laughs> I made my decision, like, let's get on with this. But, it, you know, it all required so much patience, 
right? Like patience was just this really big theme. And um, finally I was uh, ready to um, be sent back into my body. And I actually experienced the full rebirth again, not in a similar way to a baby, but um, it's what I experienced. So I, it's not so much like I witnessed myself going through a birth canal, but the process of getting me from that world to this world, I went through the same thing, not being able to breathe into the world I'd come from, from the afterlife. And so they had to take many, many different attempts. And it was very scary because they couldn't find a way to get me back. And every time they tried, I would feel like I was suffocating and they'd have to pull me back into the afterlife. And they would try again and I'd be like, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And they have to pull me back. So it was really, it was really traumatic. And again, like you have to understand, when I say it took me seven years to make sense of this, to even be able to share this today, I when I got back, when I actually made it back into the physical world, I have no, I had no clue what had just happened. Um, so although I'm articulating it today, um, at the time, I had no idea what in the world had just happened to me. Wow. Yeah, that's an intense <laughs> experience. Yeah. yeah, it was very intense. And I finally obviously made it back. And I remember the minute I got back into my body, um, some things had to happen. Uh, but then I remember my eyes opening and I knew that that was the end of my near death, ex my, my afterlife experience. My eyes had opened, my family was right by my side and I couldn't talk, but I remember pointing to some letters or something, trying to communicate with them that I had died. And when I talked to them later, once I recovered, they said, yes, we knew that you were trying to say that to us. So it just was like, ah, oh, it was a lot. Like, yes. and that, that was a lot. And while that sounds like a lot, by the time I got back from the afterlife, now I had to actually go through the trauma of waking up back in this world but I'm no longer in the afterlife where I felt loved, where there was no judgment, where I was free to be me. And not only was I back, but now I was on life support. So if you remember how when I first crossed over, I said, well, I'd like to stay because I feel like I'm such a burden. And then I woke up and what am I? I'm a burden again. <laughs> Because I'm on life. Oh, right. So you can only imagine how traumatic, um, not just finding out you're on life support and that you die. Like you don't even remember and you're finding this out. But then, you know, emotionally, I was like, why did you bring me back? You know, so it was very, it was so, it was hard. It was hard. But the experience of the afterlife just it taught me so much i mean it's really what i experience in the afterlife is is what i had to hold on to for hope um healing you know um because i was shown so much i was shown how the universe works i was shown why I had gotten sick. I was shown why things operate the way they do. Um, and I was also shown how to live my best life without being stuck and sucked into this mold, you know, that that's call it, kind of called society that just is, I mean, I don't know how else to say it, but it's, it's not, it's, it's like suffocating us. It, it's not letting us be free. You know, all these, all these rules we put on one another. It's, it, this is not who we are. It's really not. 
Um, and if and if you really stop long enough and think about it, it does seem a little weird. Um, so you know, it's it's been a journey. It's been a journey, but I have to say that you know, crossing over and witnessing what what I saw, felt, experienced, it changed my whole life. And although it was such a trauma, um, I, I wouldn't take it back for anything. Wow, uh, beautiful. Absolutely yeah. beautiful. So, uh, I mean, first of all, I just want to get a couple of facts right. So you were in a coma, though, for how long at the end of? Uh, so I, was, I was in the coma fully for about three months. So after I woke up from the initial coma, uh, coma after the near-death experience, I was in the coma for seven months, uh, seven days. Uh, my near-death experience, my experience in the afterlife ended. I woke up, but then they immediately put me back into an induced coma because I was still so fragile. So there was um, over eight weeks where they didn't know if I was going to live at all. Wow. So I was fully in a coma for a full three months um, before they started seeing signs of improvement. Right. Wow. And do you remember at that time going out of your body or were you just... Um... You know, at that time, any time I experienced anything weird, it was very, it was actually frightening. So I think that was more the, the drugs that they used to um, right. put you under. Um, it was very different from the afterlife. It's like those, when, when it was like chemically induced, it was more like nightmares. Yeah. Like fear, more, fear based sounds like. Yes. So yeah. fear -based. the others were, were just. I mean, and, and I just remember everything just so vividly, but the others were more, even the unpleasant situations, I, I, it, it was a whole different vibe. It was, it was, I knew I was living something that, that could be corrected. Right. Right. Okay. Wow. That's just so intense. My goodness. Yeah. And, and then I guess I'm, I'm curious. I mean, like you said, you had that feeling of being a burden, you know, so when, so now, are, have you been able to free yourself of that? Of yeah, that way? I did. And actually, um, I was able to, it took several years to really, again, make sense of what I had learned um, in order to even uh, access the level of wisdom and insight that I now have access to. Um, when I first came back, it was kind of like, uh, this is not really the real world. Like this world didn't, it, it, this world felt less of, less real than the afterlife. <laughs> so, and, and that I felt for quite a bit of time. So, um, there was a lot of healing I had to do just from, I mean, it's hard to say this, but just from being saved, you know, I, I had healing to work through that, you know, it's right. almost like survivor's guilt or something like that. Um, yeah, it was more, it was, it was, yeah. So that was the difficult part. Once I kind of started clearing through that, um, I think at that point, several years had gone by and I realized as I was preparing for my heart transplant, so I had to go through a final heart transplant to really um, undo all the damage that had happened to my heart when I had flatlined. So I would say it's not until what the near-death experience gave me up until the heart transplant, which was five years, I had, I was able to go home after four months in the hospital, but I was kept alive by a, a I call it a bionic heart. It was a device that, um, you know, it was, it was like a portable life support that assisted my heart um, and really kept me alive until for five years until my heart transplant. Um, the wisdom from the experience kept me alive because what I saw, again, I saw so many lifetimes during the review that I also saw the future. 
So in the live review, I saw that I was going to recover like fully. So you have to understand, like I was on this cumbersome life support device, which thank God it kept me alive, but it was a very difficult um, device to live on uh, emotionally because I had been through so much. Um, and the afterlife constantly showed me I was going to make this full body rehabil rehabilitation. So when you're walking around and this device is like kind of acting as half your heart, you're like, this is weird. Like in my afterlife, I was shown I was going to recover, yet I'm walking around year after year with this portable life support device. Um, but I just kept holding on. I'm like, I did not have that experience for an accident. I know what I saw was real. And I know the wisdom and the knowledge of how the universe works was real. And my concept of time, I knew my, my new understanding of time, I knew was real. So even though I wasn't living this, this healed body, I, I, for whatever reason, it was strong and the belief was strong enough that I held on to it. So by the time I had the heart transplant, I remember coming home. I, you know, I still needed a lot of rehabilitation. But I came home and I was like, whoa, wait a second. This is what I saw in the afterlife. I was like, this is what it meant. The, the, the complete rehabilitation. I'm like, wait a second. I have a brand new heart now. Once I get better, I have a pretty good chance of being able to actually travel anywhere I want in the world. And I was like, whoa, I saw this in the afterlife. Now again, like my situation, what happened to me medically is like one in a million chance. Like I wasn't even supposed to be alive. And here I was, I held on to that one vision of like, that I saw during my life review that I was going to survive and make a full body re re um, abilitation and it happened. Um, now I still needed to recover a bit from the surgery, but the possibility was now even more clear. Right. So, so really what happened was over the years, I kept seeing more and more evidence to support what I knew to be true for my afterlife experience. Right. So when you ask me like how I've been able to clear everything, once I got more and more evidence, I began actually, instead of living throughout the world, as people tell me how to do things, right? Or the world tells you how to do things. I started living just through my near death experience and what I knew about the world. And through that, I was able to clear stuff and clear stuff and clear stuff. So it became no longer about what I saw with my eyes. It became no longer about how my body physically reacted to, oh my God, you know, I, I can't lose that, that person in my life. I mean, I know they hurt me. But they've been in my life for 20 years. Well, if I saw in the afterlife that I made this commitment that I'm going to clear everything, that person that's hurting me has got to go. And so many times in life, we know what we need to do. We just don't listen to our own inner voice. We don't listen to our own inner knowing. But the benefit I had of having the near-death experience was that I have even more ammunition behind me to trust that inner voice. So it's not like somebody has to die to like have these crazy superpowers or anything. Everyone can do it. It's just that the biggest thing holding us back is that we doubt ourselves. We doubt that voice because what, what the voice is telling us, we can't see yet. Right. Right. And it's, it's about learning how to just live from that internal voice. And that is so scary for most. Yeah. 
you know. So yes, I have been, and I, I should clarify that it doesn't make me immune to things happening that um, I don't like or that are hurtful. But what I've noticed is that it's giving me another opportunity to practice exactly what I know and that I know what it felt like in heaven. I know what it felt like without the judgment. I know what it felt like knowing that it was in my control not to allow other people's judgment make me feel small, constricted, uh, less than, unworthy, and that I was better off um, energetically having no friends than two friends that treat me like crap, right. which is so scary. But I realized that if you, if you just eliminated what is hurting you, your body and your cells have time to actually rejuvenate and come to life and then start attracting the healthier people and the healthier relationships that you want. So it really was about, it was about understanding that. It was about understanding that, no, the negativity is not better than no, than no attention. You know what I mean? Exactly. And, That's powerful. That's really yeah. powerful. So, um, so yeah, so, so much wisdom came from, from my near death story. And, um, I have really been able to overcome a lot of fears. I've had fears of public speaking, fears of just getting back into business. Um, you know, and just being equipped with those tools to help me clear through some of those issues and then get back on track, back into momentum and living in my purpose. So it was really powerful. <laughs> wow. Beautiful. Oh my gosh, Sherry, that's just stunning. Um, I'd love to pull some cards for you if you're open for a little reading. I would love that. <laughs> awesome. I was going to ask, I don't know if you're holding your mic, but it's making a lot of noise. I don't know. Is there a way to set it down? Yeah, I just didn't want it for some reason. It was, it was wobbling or something. Well, it was like sitting on the keyboard for some reason. Oh. <laughs> sitting. oh. I don't know. I wasn't doing that before. Hold on one second. And we'll cut this part out. No worries. But I was just, it was making noise and I was. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, wait. This should be better. Okay. There we go. Okay, great. <laughs> okay, so let me uh, shuffle my cards. Okay. And see what spirit has to say. Yes. <laughs> okay. So the first card uh, is the blockage card. And so what came up was abundance. Oh. And um, I guess I'm just trying to see what... I feel like it's, it's kind of along the lines of what you were just talking about, that it's, it's better not to have like this abundance in your life if it's not truly what you're meant to have or what, what's, what's, um, what's true for you, you know, because I think so many people are always looking to, to have more, have more, have more. And yet at the end of the day, having all that moreness <laughs> is not feeding your soul when it's the wrong when it's when it's not coming from your heart does that make sense absolutely it's actually something yeah. i'm going through right now which is um i think just sharing my story generated so much attention but now i'm kind of starting to say okay hold up i need some time to myself to regroup and really decide you know what it what it is i want in my life what feels in alignment and in alignment and what doesn't. Wow. I just have to tell you, this is, I'm just having deja vu. I, my interview yesterday had the exact same thing and she just cleared out a whole bunch of things. And she's like, I made people angry and upset. <laughs> and, but she's like, I have to be true to myself because if I keep going forward and doing these things that I don't want to do, nobody is being served. Absolutely. So, I yeah. love, I mean, this is so powerful. This, yeah. this message right yeah. now is for everybody that yeah. if you're not in alignment with everything that's going on in your life, it's, it's having more of it is not good. Yeah. <laughs> it in fact, it depletes you, you know, having all, like you said, all this media attention, all of this, 
it sounds so glamorous and exciting, but at the end of the day, if it's not feeding your soul, it's depleting. Absolutely. And that's, that's the barometer right there is, you know, always checking in with yourself and saying, you know, how does this actually really feel? Like, of course, it's great to be on media and all that, but how does it really feel? How did, how, like, what's, what's your energy level, you know? And uh, for me, I mean, I'm actually in the process of getting my energy level back. I mean, I was telling you before the show, just the number of speaking events that I've been doing. And while I love it and it's exciting, um, I, I still have to focus on taking care of myself. We all do. Um, it's very, very easy to get uh, caught up in the moreness, more, more, more of, of, the world you know it's exciting it's fun it's you know keeps you on your toes like trust me i love it <laughs> but at the end of the day you know i remember when i like finally all the traveling from last year slowed down and i gave myself like two months of just i cleared my schedule and by this took till the second month for me to realize whoa i am burnt out I didn't realize till the second month of clearing my schedule, like nothing on my plate, but it didn't hit me till month two, how burnt out I was. Wow. Right. And you had, you were telling me t where, where you had spoken all over the world, where you had gone to all Bali over. and Bali, Greece, Italy, um, Spain, Hawaii, London. <laughs> oh my gosh. I mean, that's exhausting for anybody, but somebody with a heart transplant, I mean, you've yeah. only been recovering what for a couple of years, right? Yeah, I'm still recovering. And like in another, I think month, I've got to go to Sweden. <laughs> so. <laughs> you need to get your rest. Well, this is great. I love it. the second card is uh, your action card and it's just amazing. It's opening and it's a giant pink heart. Oh, which, I love it. Um, I mean, you can't get any more real than this because, you know, we're talking about your heart transplant and opening and, and that's exactly, again, this is just reconfirmation of what we've just talked about is that it's opening your heart to um, to what it is that feeds your soul and you're in charge of that. Nobody else. It doesn't matter what people say to you or what critics, you know, critics say, or, you know, or even people that are, are pouring love on you. If it's not the love that you need for you, you know, like again, all the media attention, it feels like, Oh, look at all this, you know, accolades and all that. Well, that's great if it feeds you, but if it's, if it's tiring you out or, you know, not taking you in the direction you want to be going, um, even Raymond Moody, who I interviewed on, on this, uh, on my podcast a few months ago said, gosh, you know, writing that book, it changed my life. And I, if, if I could do it over, I wouldn't do it because <laughs> it's in a direction that he's like, this is not what I, where I wanted to go. So it's super important to have intention about what we do in every way. Absolutely. And I think what's really great, like, I love that you mentioned intention because one of the things I've learned with intention, and you know, we all do this, we get off track. I get off track still, even after my near death experience, you know, I forgive myself and then I start a new day, right? So wherever you are in life, I mean, every day really is a new chance to start over. Um, so I do want to just say that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, it's really, um, you know, I, I've really realized that whenever I set an intention, it can't just be like my intention is to speak on like 50 stages. It's got to be like my intention is to feel safe, to feel whole, to feel nurtured. Like, so I tend to try as much as I can without getting distracted. <laughs> but, but the best intentions that I find that work for me is are when I set the intention based on how I want to feel. I love that. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. It's how, how do I want to feel? Because no one wants to end up with all this media and still feel alone. You know, you don't want to end up with all this media and like be sick. Um, Absolutely. Well, and in my, in my case, what I help people, you know, millionaire medium, like I, I work with all these people who have tons of money and they're still not happy because all they wanted was the money, money, money. And it's like people having more money just creates more problems <laughs> yes. and more, you know, more complexity in, in your life. And so if you're not ready to take that on, 
you know, I mean, and I'm not saying having more money is necessarily a bad thing, but it's just, it's, it's not what people are looking for. They're looking for security. They're looking for happiness. They're looking for, you know, love in their life. And so that's, I love that you say intention is about how do I want to feel? That's yeah, so absolutely. important. Yeah. And I'm really glad you brought that up about money because you can even see it now in with just with the digital age, you know, just ramping up, you know, a lot of what you see are a lot of people wanting to be either entrepreneurs or finding ways to make more and more and more money. But what they're finding is more and more people are feeling more lonely. They're feeling, right. Um, right. The hustle they're feeling yes, disconnected, more. burned out. Yes, yeah. Yes. So, you know, you're right. I mean, it's, it's not about that. It, you know, we, we want the benefits, right? It's not necessarily right. that we want all the stress that comes with money. We want, we want the, um, the benefits of how we'll feel. Exactly. Yeah. Which is, so that's a support. Well, and now the final card, which I, I mean, again, this is just comes full circle. The yeah. outcome is passion. So how perfect, because yeah. that's exactly what we're saying is that by setting your intention for how you want to feel, opening your heart to that. And then that's what creates the passion in your life. You know, that's, that'll bring forth to you, you know, those feelings. And, and like you said about setting the, the goal of speaking on 50 stages, well, in, <laughs> like you said, set that aside and say, I want to speak, but I want to make an impact on people. I want to, and I want to feel nurtured and secure and safe yes. and, you yeah. know, in intimate settings or whatever it is that yeah. you want to feel as opposed to just, you know, going into some corporate sterile environment where they're just, you know, crossing their arms and staring at you, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's not so much fun. <laughs> I didn't come back to life for this. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, and I, I think I love, again, your story. It just brings it to, you know, anyone that even if they haven't had a near death experience, which most people haven't. Um, but, but it brings about what truly are we here on this earth for, you know, it's to experience love and to experience our fullness of who we are. Absolutely. Yeah, it really is. And I think, um, you know, and this is just such a perfect conversation. I have to tell you for just everything right now, even the fact that it's the beginning of the year, this is really, really a great conversation for everyone. Um, because, uh, you know, anytime between, you know, the new year and like spring for me is when I love to kind of like bask in, you know, how do I really want the rest of this year to feel? <laughs> um, so now it's not too late to set your intentions for the rest of the year, you know, set them, be really clear about how you want to feel and make sure that at the heart of your intention, it's that you feel safe and, and um, nourished, you know, yes. um, I think so many times we forget to, uh, we forget to ask for that nourishment because <laughs> we think it's just going to come just from the fact that we're eating like breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so true. That's so true. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, that is wonderful. Well, let, tell people how they can find you. And um, of course, we'll have the links on my website, but um, yeah. go ahead and. So, yeah. So you can definitely um, find me at my website which is sherryame.com, that's C-H-E-R-I-E-A-I-M-E-E.com. And I'm really excited because it should be either April or May. I'm doing a whole rebrand, so a whole brand new website. It's going to be really exciting. I'm going to have some master classes on there for anybody that wants to jump on a video uh, with me, just talking a little bit more about, you know, how I keep myself healthy. How do I get through every day? How do I get through the stresses of everyday life, you know, especially after this, this massive trauma that I just experienced, you know, I didn't, I didn't just kind of end up here traveling around the world after such a massive tragedy without doing, uh, you know, the inner work and, and really taking care of myself. So um, I'm going to go through all that and even share tips on like when you get off track, like I did last year, um, how to get yourself back on track. So I'm excited. I'm, I'm just excited. Um, and one thing I want to really mention is that it's been a fascinating journey coming back from my near-death experience, experiencing what it's like to kind of be in more of the upper, um, higher dimensional realms, you know, when I first got back here. And then over the years, merging myself back into 
you know, the business world and all that stuff, experiencing what that's like, and then pivoting and realizing how I want to make a better choice for myself. So that I think is so interesting because I haven't really read many experiences of people having this journey, this awakening, going back into such a dense field like technology and business right? with, with that knowledge and then taking that lesson and coming back out to then teach the world. So I love it. I'm I love it so much. And I feel like I'm right there with you. And again, the woman I interviewed yesterday, same thing that coming from, I mean, uh, be, me being a former an accountant, you yeah. know, and then doing the spiritual work and really bridging that gap for people and you in the technology world, you know, the same thing and, and helping people really elevate themselves out of that real, like you said, dense. <laughs> So dense. <laughs> so dense, that place of, um, and really lightening things up and helping everybody find, you know, a better place to, to be Absolutely. in this world. Absolutely. We're all in this together. That's <laughs> right. Well, thank you so much, Sherry. This was so much fun. I love seeing you and um, just bless you on your journey. You're just such an amazing woman. Thank you too, Lisa. This has been absolutely amazing. And you look amazing. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the Exploring Death podcast. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. Before you make any financial or legal decisions, consult a professional. This show is copyrighted by Exploring Death. Written permission must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting.